What does it take to create a culture to advance disciple making? To begin a true movement of disciples making disciples. A movement that is bigger than you, bigger than your church, bigger than your city. A Holy Spirit movement that goes far beyond our expectations to the ends of the earth for all eternity. Many books, methods, and ideas exist on how we are to do this. But why do we see so few disciple-making movements in America? What if we had the exact model and had been given the exact method to accomplish this mission? We do. It is the very life of Christ. 1 John 2.6 tells us we are to live as Jesus lived, to walk as he walked. Author and global disciple-maker Dan Spader spent his life studying the life and ministry of Jesus and identifies Christ's mission, model, and method on how we can make disciples as Jesus did. The Like Jesus platform is a church-wide, interactive learning and discussion on the life of Christ, including both print and digital resources as well as real-time assessments and metrics. You can live like Jesus. You can make disciples like Jesus. You can create a culture where disciple-making movements begin, just like Jesus. I got to tell you, I am excited about starting this series. It's something that I've been looking at for, gosh, over a year now. And um, it's finally time for us to begin. And uh, we uh, oftentimes think that maybe we can't be like Jesus. And we're going to be looking at that today, definitely. Um, but for the foreseeable future, like I said, it's kind of unclear how this is going to work. Um, we're going to be doing this for the next eight weeks. But I also know that if we go after something for like two years straight, we can kind of lose some traction. And so we're probably going to come back to this in September of 2020 um, and um, do another whole 10 weeks uh, go at it, um, but um, it's just something that we as Christians have to begin to look at, and so over this time, we're going to be looking at three things, and you can see them on the stage behind me, we're going to be looking at, if I stand here, if I, no matter where I stand, I'm going to stand in front of somebody, so I'll try to, get, maybe I'll get over here, this work. we're going to be looking at the mission of Jesus over these eight weeks, and this is what Jesus calls us to do, all right, and, we're, and these four chairs are going to be up here every week, and we're going to talk about what these four chairs mean, some of you have already heard what these four chairs mean, some of you haven't, that's okay, we're going to be diving into that, we're going to be looking, at, and then the next set, we're going to be looking at the model of who Jesus calls us to be. And then the last set is the methods that Jesus used, how Jesus calls us to make disciples. Because we want to take people from where they are to where God wants them to be. That means he wants you to be a disciple. He wants you to be a learner. We talked about that recently. The, 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 the word disciple is only a big word for the word the learner or follower. You're a follower of Jesus. So why do we do this? Why do we do this? Well, we have been called to it. We're called to make disciples by Jesus in Matthew 28. We're called to go, therefore, and do what? Make disciples. We're called to go and do it. So that means if we are not currently making disciples, what are we doing? We're not following Jesus. If we are not making disciples, if we as individuals are not actively seeking to make dis up disciples of the people around us, we are not following the command of Jesus Christ. This isn't something that the church should have to tell you to do. This is something that we should be doing as people who love Jesus, who want to follow him with our lives. So we got to be making disciples. But then we go to 1 John 2, 6. You heard it as I said on the video. I'm going to read it again. It says this. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, many, if not most of us here today, would say that we live in God, that we want to live in God and for God. And if that's the case for you, then you are called to live like Jesus. So if I had the opportunity to sit down with you at Starbucks and you and I were talking and I asked you the question, how did Jesus live? What would be some of your short answers? I don't want like long treaties here, but what would be some of your shorter answers? If I asked you how Jesus lived, what would be some of your answers? Humble? What was that? Perfectly? With, with, 
With compassion? Love sinners. Love sinners, yeah. Teacher? Come on, guys. How do you live? Forgiving. Forgiving? What was that? Prayerfully. Prayerfully. Simply. As an example. Here's some of what I wrote down. He loved others. He lived in the Spirit. Did miracles. Perfect. He's God. He taught others. He is the Word made flesh. He emptied himself so he was selfless. He was a servant. Obedient to the point of death on the cross. Humble, focused, intentional. So we're going to be like Jesus. See, these are, and this is even way specific, or not, way un, un, unspecific. This is like just terms overall of what he did. We're not even getting into the specifics yet. And this whole list, everything that we pretty much said, it's way over our heads. It's way over our heads. Way, above, way beyond our ability. If we stay at this level, it's way too easy to say, and I bet so many of us have said this, I can't really be like Jesus. I can try, but I can't really live like Jesus. I can't do it because he's God. So we continue trying, and we never even get close. See, we're called to have the mind of Christ in Philippians 2.5. And Jesus even said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. That's John 14.12. Jesus told us that we would do greater things than what even he did. And yet so often we sit here and we go, we can't be like Jesus. So the question today has to be, would God call us to be and do things that we simply cannot do? Can you be like Jesus? And as we study the life of Jesus, as we dig into his life, you're going to see that it is possible to live like Jesus because we have access to the same power that Jesus did when he lived on this earth. We have access to that same power. And when we, get, and when we look at him, it's going to be exciting. It's exciting to be able to look at the person of Jesus. And I hope we have a little bit of excitement ourselves. I mean, for me, it's even more heightened. I'm telling you, I'm studying for this. I'm, as I study for this, we're talking about, uh, I was reading a set patch of scripture where Jesus was, was in Capernaum. And he cast a demon out in the, in the synagogue there. I stood in the place where he cast the demon out. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to bring up Israel all the time because it changes how you view scripture. It changes it because you see it. I read the scripture and I can picture exactly what the place looks like because I stood in the places that Jesus was. The life of Jesus is absolutely amazing. When we get a chance to look at our Savior, he's the one who died on the cross and saved us from our sins. He rose from the dead to conquer sin and death for us. We get to look at him. We get to look at him. I hope there's a little twinge of excitement about that. If there's not, I pray God's spirit works in your heart. Because I don't want this to be just another series. I don't want this to be just a program. I don't want this to be just another community group study. I am praying so much that this gets into our lives and changes us from the inside out. Because I'm telling you something, if it doesn't, again, we will not do anything that matters. We'll play the game our entire lives and hopefully we follow Jesus a little bit. And when we die, there won't be any legacy that we leave for the kingdom of God. Because every single one of us is called to make disciples who then go on and make disciples. We don't have to just survive. We can see God use us in great and mighty ways. And that is my prayer for us as we move forward. But so often, all we look at is the message of Jesus. We look at just his message, what he taught. And we have to start there. It's extremely important. But we do that at the expense of the model that he gave us to be and the methods that he used to accomplish what he did so that we can accomplish the same things. So as we do this, we're going to look at a comprehensive view of Jesus' life and his ministry, and that begins today. Today, um, it's a quick overview of where we're going. We're not going to get into a lot of specifics today. I want to give you an overview and and then we're going to hit the ground running next week as well. 
So we're going to be looking at three things today. Jesus' message overall, his methods overall, and some of his model. Okay? It allows us to see the details of Jesus' life this way as we go deeper into this. To look at one without the others is only part of the story. It's easy to look at Jesus' message, but not the methods to convey that message that he used. So if we only look at the message and we're like, well, that's great. And then we come up with our own ways to deliver it. But wait a minute, Jesus delivered it, delivered it in a specific way. And we could say that was done for a specific people, and that might be true, but people still like stories today. People still like, the, the method of communication hasn't changed all that much. Maybe with technology and those kind of things, but the message doesn't change. Methods can, but Jesus used a method as well to impact the hearts of the people in front of him. And we're going to look at that. Sometimes we might look at the methods of Jesus, but without a conviction or understanding of the message, the methods don't matter. We have to have them both. And so all three of these are so important, and, and, and it goes into looking at the life of Jesus. He's our example in every way. And of course, as we go through this, his message will be, it's not like we're going to put the message aside. His message is going to be interwoven through this whole process. And so it's, I'm excited to see what, what, what God's going to do in, in, in and through us. <coughs> so we start today with Jesus' message. What was his message? Again, we're going to look at this throughout it, but I want to give us a synopsis of the beginning. Um, there are many things we could look and state at about in his message. We could look at a lot of different things. I mean, he created, he sustains us by his blood. He redeems us and make us, makes us holy. There's hope for the hopeless, light in the darkness, rest for the weary, rest for the sinner, healing for the sick, both physically and spiritually. The cross shows us the price of sin and the price he paid and his resurrection gives us eternal life. And so we could go into any of those things, but really his entire message can be summarized in three statements that he made. Okay? The first one he made in Mark 1, 14 to 15. It's repent and believe. Repent and believe. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. Jesus is calling people to repent. Turn from the life of sin. Not just keep playing in it and say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus, but I'm making a mud pie of my sin. I'm just over here, but I love you. That's, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying repenting and believing in Jesus Christ. He calls us to turn away from that and believe. Then he says something really, really different in John 3.3. 3. You must be born again. Born again. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This issue of being born again is, I don't know, I feel like it's become kind of controversial in some circles in the church. Like, if you believe in being born again, then you're some kind of radical or you're a fundy. You're a fundamentalist, right? Or something like that. The idea of being born again is simply this. I used to be this way. I met Jesus and he changed my life as though I was born again, as though I'm a brand new person. The old is gone. The new has come. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. That's what he's saying. So I'll tell you what, if somebody wants to call me a wacko because I believe in being a born again Christian, being that radical for Jesus Christ and saying I once was lost, but now I'm found and now I'm a totally different person, then call me a wacko. Because that's what Jesus tells us to be. He tells us to be born again, to be different than what we used to be. And finally, he says this, you can have eternal life. John 3, 36, um, John the Baptist was saying this, but Jesus taught this as well. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not even see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Jesus is the way maker. He is the difference maker. It's funny, in so many times, even in your conversations, you might have conversations about God. But when you introduce the name of Jesus, the conversation can change. And I want you to know, it's about Jesus. The entirety of this book, the entirety of God's word is about Jesus Christ. Him coming to earth as a human being. Fully God. Fully human. We're going to talk about that too, that we cannot sacrifice his humanity for his deity. We cannot sacrifice his deity for his humanity. 
He is both 100%, 100% equals 100% when it comes to Jesus. This is all about him. And because it's all about him, we need to be all about him. We've got to point people to Jesus, God's son, because that's the way to eternal life. So that's over an overview of his message. His method, and this is only a quick glance at his method because we're going to dig into that later on in the series. Um, but Jesus invited his disciples to journey with him, to go with him to places toward accomplishing the Father's mission. He included them in what he was doing, and we have to pay attention to that. And there's three things Jesus was, though, that we find when we really look into the life of Jesus. The first thing, he was relational. He was relational. He spent time with people. He spoke to people. He loved people. He let the children come to him when the disciples were like, no, 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 don't let the kids, he's too, he's like, wait a minute, let the kids come to me. I want them to be here and to, and to see me. Jesus basically is saying, I'm not too important for anyone. And see, when we were in Caesarea Philippi, um, in Israel, there is a huge fig tree that's right outside where a bunch of pagan temples were. A place where people were sacrificed to uh, the god Pan to um, just make him happy, I guess. And Jesus sat somewhere around that fig tree with his disciples. And he asked his disciples, some people say that I'm Elijah, some people say I'm Moses, who do you say that I am? And that is the first place that Peter stepped up and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They had, they had, they had to be with each other for him to realize that. And they spent time together, and was, Gene and I were talking when we were, when we were at that fig tree, and we looked and we were like, can't you just see Jesus and the disciples sitting here? spending time together talking about the kingdom of God, especially since this is a place where he said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. That's a whole nother sermon. He spent time with his disciples. He showed them how to live. He taught them and he called them friends. In John 15, 15, it says this, no longer do I call you servants for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. He calls us his friends. Jesus is relational. Now, Jesus is missional. That's basically a big word for he was always on mission. He was always doing something for the kingdom of God. He sent his disciples out to do the work of the Father. He showed them the, the example, and then he let them do it. He was always on mission. And he sent his disciples out to do the same. A few passages. John 17, 15, as you, the Father, sent me into the world, so I have sent them, his disciples, into the world. Also us. We are his disciples too. John 20, 21 to 22 says this. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And then Acts 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Where his witnesses were to be on mission like Jesus was. And then finally, he was intentional. He was intentional. So he gave the disciples four challenges. And these are what these four chairs behind me, the four steps in the study that we're starting in our community groups, that's what they're based upon. Just as Jesus was intentional, we're going to try and seek to do the same. The series is part of like Jesus. It's an overall strategy. This, this idea of the mission of Jesus is part of three, three series that we're going to do. Um, but this is focusing on a book called Four Chair Discipleship. And so, again, our mission at the church is to lead people from where they are to where God wants them to be. And we want you to be able to identify where you currently are because you can't take your next step until you identify where you are. You have to identify where you are. And I know there's some of us that don't like taking assessments and there's different things that, you know, it's not that easy. No, it's not that simple. But I got to ask you a question. When's the last time you spent time focusing on learning what it meant to take your next step in your walk with the Lord? Because as we come here this morning, we say we love Jesus, we say all these things, and yet we can often spend so little time actually getting to know him. 
And I think some people will even go, well, I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time. I'm going to challenge this this morning. You have time for what you is important to you. Every single one of us has time for what is important to us. And really, bottom line, I'm not saying this with any desire to put any guilt on us at all. Really what I want is I want us to be honest with ourselves. You know, um, I was going to share a story about one of my daughters, but I don't have permission. And I, 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 grant, I told them that I would never get to share a story without permission. So I'm not going to share that story. I almost did, though. Um, but it's way too easy to lie to ourselves about stuff. You know, I love to lie to myself and say, I can eat that. I don't have to work out and I'll still lose weight. That's a great lie to believe. It doesn't work, but that's what, you know. And we can often sit here and think, man, if I just go to church for an hour a week, and if I make it a couple times a month, I don't really need to spend that much time with people because my relationship with God is my own. I don't really need anybody else helping me. And I'm surely not going to let anybody look at my life and be honest with somebody that I may have known for the last few weeks or maybe even the last couple of years. I'm not going to let them look at my life and actually tell me where they think I could grow in Jesus. I'm good where I am. I bet if I ask you to raise a hand, almost all of us were just hit by at least one of those statements. We've all been there. We have to look at what Jesus did, how he lived, and how he impacted the lives of those disciples. What did the disciples do to follow Jesus? They left it all. Could God call you to that? Yes. He could. Will he? I don't know. I don't know if you're called to the other side of the world. Maybe you are. I do know you're called to where you are right now. To be more relational, intentional, and missional with the people that are in your life right now. I want to encourage you at the beginning of the series. Don't go, well, I'm not going to community group. I don't have time. You make time for what's important to you. You make time for what's important to you. And you can go to a community group and sit there and not really say anything and stay in the background of the end and go, well, community groups don't work. Yeah, you're right. You sat there. Didn't say anything. You didn't really get involved. You just sat there. Again, I want us to be honest with ourselves. Be honest with yourself, first and foremost, about where you are. And this whole process will help you begin to do that. It'll help you begin to do that. So, like I said earlier... The first thing we need to do, we got this next slide coming up. The first thing we need to do is download that app. All right? So, again, you don't have to do it now. In fact, I actually don't want you to do it now because over the, if you do it now and something doesn't work right for the next five minutes, that's all you're going to be thinking about. You're going to think about what I'm saying. So, don't do it now. But I did send out that email um, last week. All right? Now, I want you to know that if you're not currently in the loop, if you're not getting emails from the church, I'm going to send out that same email today about 3 p.m. If you text loop to 248-780-7004, again, the bulletin, or in the, the numbers in the bulletin, if you text loop and fill out the card at the link, I'm telling you, I'm st- I got to tell you, I have an app <coughs> on my phone. Every time somebody texts loop to that number, it says this phone number, loop. And then it shows me that that our system sends you the text that says, click the link. You want to know what happens once you fill out that form? It shows me that the system sent you an email and said, hey, you're in the loop. You want to know how many people have not gotten that email? Probably about 50, 60% because you're not filling out the form. And if you don't fill out the form, you're not going to get the emails, okay? So we have to take the next step. It's not that hard. You take your finger. And there's little blue text, and you go, bloop, boom, and it pops up like magic on your phone. And then you just fill it out, and you're done. So, but I'm telling you, if you're not filling out that form, you're not going to get the emails, okay? You could even go, uh, and actually, we're not, we don't have a link up there yet, I don't think. No, do we? Okay. But 248-780-7004. That'll give you all the instructions for what's coming up in Like Jesus when it comes to community group. And in this app... 
It has the book and study guides, all this stuff there for you for free. All right. Now, some of you don't like, I, I will tell you, I wouldn't really want to read the book on my phone. It's great on my iPad, but not on my phone. I will say the nice thing is that this app is really well thought out. You could actually save highlights of the book. There's all kinds of things you can do in the app. It's really, really beneficial. But I also bought 20 paper copies of the book for Chair Discipleship if you want to have a paper copy, a physical copy of it. There's some of us that, I love the smell of books. You know, I, all right, that's fine. Me, I love the smell of my iPad. So, but the reality is, is if you like a paper book, you can get one of those too, okay? Um, already had a couple of you raise their hands. You know, that's all right. So, see your small group leader. Um, you might not get them today or when it, it, we'll figure that out. They're in my office right now, okay? So, those are available. But if you have any questions about the app, text me. My phone number is in the bulletin. Text me, email me. I'll help you. I've already walked three or four people through it. Oh, I should also tell you, there's another app called Like Jesus in the App Store. Again, I think I said it earlier. I'm saying it again. Look for the one that has the dots with the circle. Okay? That's what you're looking for. All right? That's enough about the app. If you have questions, let me know. But these four challenges that, that, that we're going to be looking at over these next eight weeks, ten weeks in community group are these. The first one is this. Come and see. And that's the challenge for the person in the first chair. That's the challenge for the person in the first chair. And this is the chair of the person who is lost, who does not yet know Jesus. And some people are like, that's a fly. Man. That's always fun. Um, some people go, you're calling people lost. It's kind of offensive. And I get that. I even struggle with using the idea of a lost, uh, being, somebody being a lost person. That can be offensive. But my friend, Jason, Jay Fast, who is one of the missionaries that we support, um, is with Sun Life. And this is, this is part of their strategy as well. Um, he said it so well when he came, my gosh, about six months ago. And he said, if you, lo if you lose your iPhone, you lose your phone, you don't know where it is, what do you do? Well, the first thing we probably do is, ah! <laughs> and then we don't stop until we find it, usually, because it's important to us. Something that is lost if, it's, if you think it's lost, then that means you think it's important. See, Jesus thinks every person on this earth is important. He died for everyone. And so there are the people that don't know Jesus, they are lost. Because they're lost without a hope. No hope of eternal life. And so somebody who's in this first chair is the lost person. And the biggest thing that person needs, they need to come and see who Jesus is. They need to come and see. And Jesus did that to the disciples too. We're going we're gonna to see that. Then he said, follow me, follow me. This second chair right here, this is, the, this is the, the chair of the believer. Somebody who believes and is now a child of God, but is still trying to grow. Sometimes we stagnate. In fact, the majority of us in the church are going to end up being in chair two. And, but the reality for so many of us is many of us have been in chair two for the majority of our lives. We've never actually gone to chair three, which we'll talk about in this series too. But the majority of us are here, and I'm already seeing that in the assessments that's being taken. Now, most of us are in somewhere in chair two. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that we haven't taken the next step in our walks with the Lord. And that's where we want to have, we don't want, we don't want our church to be a place where we can just sit and soak. We want to be sent and go. We don't want to sit and soak. We want to be sent and go. Because we want the kingdom of God to be growing in this place and in our community because that's why he has us here. That's why he has us here. We want to be intentional about helping everybody take their next step. And so the challenge for somebody in chair number two is follow me. Learn what it means to follow me. What is Jesus calling us to do? Then the third chair. This is the chair of the worker, who Jesus called us to be. So now you're working. And, but the thing is, is a lot of us will say, well, I'm a worker. It's not about doing things. It's not about serving in the children's ministry. It's not about setting and tearing up chairs and setting and tearing up the building or doing yard work or that kind of stuff for the church. Working is what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses starting in Jerusalem. 
Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the world. Workers share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the people around them. They look for opportunities to have spiritual conversations and you help lead people to Jesus with your words, your actions, and your life. That's what a worker in the kingdom does. A worker doesn't necessarily do things. They direct people to Jesus. Not that we don't need the other things, but we've substituted the work that has to be done for the work that's urgent. We're not called to build churches. We're called to make disciples. And that includes evangelism. That includes going out and sharing the gospel. And so the challenge for the person in chair three is follow, uh, sorry, fish for people. You can be taught to fish for people. It goes in, sometimes he says something profound. Right? He's the guy who cut off the ear because Jesus would get into rest and he's like, no, not going to happen. Boom. Jesus says, no, 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 we don't live by the sword because if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. And then he puts the ear back on. Right? Peter's also the one who denied Jesus three times after saying, no way, I'll never do that. I identify with Peter. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm that guy. But if you look at his life, if you really take a look a little bit, in fact, he's the first one to say you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He's that guy. But his story goes like this. He was called to be a follower of Jesus in John chapter 1. Then he follows Jesus everywhere, and he goes and hears him speak and teach continually. He continues to hear him speak and teach. He cuts off the ear of the soldier trying to arrest Jesus. He denies knowing Jesus three times. He's restored by Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Again, saw the place where Peter was restored. Oh, so cool. Then in Acts 2, we see Peter teaching the people and beginning the church, and thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ. You can see a progression in Peter's life. He goes from this guy who's just always just out there to a man who has now learned more about who Jesus is. He's becoming like him. And now he's using all of the things that he's been gifted because gifts come with a good side and a bad side, right? They can be used for good or for evil. We're all superheroes, all right? Are you, every single one of us in here has been gifted, but Peter moved toward fully trained status as Jesus used his personality for the kingdom and he taught him. Peter was specifically designed and created to fill that spot that the living word Jesus Christ had for him. His rougher spots were smooth as he learned to be like Jesus and he's transformed from a fisherman to a powerful mouthpiece for the kingdom of God. That would be like somebody working at McDonald's and the next thing you know, three years, three years later, this person is leading people to Jesus and is leading a lot of people, but out of humility and from how he's gifted. Do you think that just happened? Or do you think that Jesus might have had a plan? We're going to see that he had a plan over this series. Second thing is, we don't see the value of a chronological approach when we study about Jesus. We look at the Gospels, we think that it wasn't really put together chronologically, so we kind of just pick and choose, and we miss the model that Jesus used to minister and grow the disciples. I'm excited about this because I've looked at this briefly, but not intently, and I'm so looking forward to looking at this with you. <laughs> And we might think that it wasn't done orderly, but yet then again, it was because Luke starts his gospel by saying that he's writing an orderly account for Theophilus. And the Greek word there actually means a successive or chronological record. The book of Luke is chronological. But for instance, we can see this um, in Luke, or sorry, in Mark 117. Because we have to see how Jesus spent time with the disciples, how much he spent with them, and the order in which he did things. So in Mark 1.17, if we were to turn there, Jesus calls his disciples to follow him, and then he says that he will make them fishers of men. And so many times we think in Mark 1.17, that's the first place that Peter, I think Peter, James, and John, that's the first time Jesus called them to follow him. It's the first time they've seen Jesus, it's there, and they're dropping everything and they're going to follow him. The truth of the matter is, 
that the chronological study tells us otherwise. When you look at a harmony of the Gospels, a harmony of the Gospels only means this. You take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you map them all out, and you map them out to say this, uh, like, like for instance, this happens in this book, this book, and this book, and then you look at how each Gospel writer wrote that down and recorded it. And you can begin to see a chronology there. In Mark 1.17, this passage where Peter and James and John were called, by the time Jesus brings up the whole idea of fishing for men, it wasn't his first call. These guys have probably been around Jesus for about 18 months at this time. And we can miss that when we don't look into the scripture and really study it. And see that. Because we think, oh, we're called to fish for people right away. No, these guys had been around Jesus for a while. He was teaching them how to fish for people before he ever called them to fish for people. And he does that for us too. And so we're going to look at his life chronologically. I'm excited about this. And then finally, this is a big one for all of us. We assume that, it, that, we assume that none of us, we assume that ourselves, we cannot be like Jesus because he's God. We just can't be like him. And so we kind of try, but then we don't really try. And it's true. Jesus is God. He wasn't God. He is God. He is perfect and he lived a f perfect life. But Jesus was also fully human. He was like us in every way, but was without sin. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 says this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect, who in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may find, receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. See, Jesus engaged in the act of disciple making as a human being. He engaged in it as a human being. So often we only look at Jesus through the lens of his deity, his godness. We have to look at Jesus through the lens of his humanity as well. Because that, if we only look at one, it only provides a partial view of who Jesus was and is. If we look at only one, we will step back and go, I can't do that. Because we always focus on his deity. We can be the human being Jesus was. We can be like him in his humanity. We can live out. It's not just his message that was ordained. It was his methods. It was his model. His mission. All of these things are ordained. Jesus didn't just do things haphazardly. He did them purposefully. And we're going to look at that. If there's one thing you walk away with, this is what I want you to walk away with this morning. Jesus modeled a pattern for us to follow in making disciples. He modeled that pattern. And we have to look at that pattern to see what it takes. All the words Jesus used, the way he lived, the things he did, how he did them. He did them on purpose. He's our example in everything. And he's our example when it comes to living, walking, walking and making disciples like Jesus. Here's the encouragement though, and I want you to hear this this morning. This is not like the Geico commercial of Pinocchio that's saying, you have potential, you have potential, you have, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not lying right now, all right? I want you to hear me. Every single one of us is gifted. That you are designed and gifted for the place that God has called you to. You are. You may feel like you don't have anything to offer the kingdom of God. That is from the pit of hell. Because he doesn't want you to be like Jesus. Because he knows if you do, you're going to be dangerous for the kingdom of God. And you know what's going to happen? Satan's going to know your name. That's a whole other message I'm not going to go into this morning. But I'll tell you what, I want Satan to know my name because if he knows my name, it means I'm doing something for Jesus. And I'm making a difference in the kingdom of God. And every single one of us here is designed, created, placed strategically by God to build the kingdom where you are. Is it where you're going to stay? I can tell you, I didn't plan on being in Michigan ever in my lifetime. And now we've been here almost 17, we're going on 17 years now. I don't know what God's going to do from you, but I can tell you, do with you, but I can tell you this, it'll be good. 
and you will do even greater things than Jesus did. You want to know why I know that? Because he said it. We're called to that. Making disciples doesn't have to be a, be a mystery. It's about relationship, staying on mission, and being intentional. It's only when that breaks down that we don't accomplish our calling. And this blows my mind, and I'm so grateful for this, and this is where we're going to end. We depend on the same things, the same things <coughs> that Jesus depended upon to live his life. And to live out his calling. He drew strength and based his ministry on these things. Number one, he based it on God's word. When he was in the wilderness and the spirit took him out into the wilderness to be tempted, what did he do? He quoted scripture. Granted, the Bible that he had was the Torah. It was the Old Testament. So he quoted scripture to overcome. Why should we do any less? We have access to the same thing Jesus had. And then he says in Matthew chapter 5, he didn't come to abolish the law, he came to fulfill it. He is the word made flesh and dwelled among us. We have access to God's word. We have access to prayer. Jesus preaching in Galilee and all the towns. In Mark 135, he would go around Galilee and he preached everywhere. And it's doable because it's really just a lake. It's really a lake. It's not the sea. It's a lake. But Jesus went all around and he taught from boats on the sea. And he, and he taught in these villages and these towns and in these, in these synagogues. And you know what he did regularly? Even though he had all these people following him. Mark 135, it says, he drew away often and he prayed. He got his power from prayer. That's why these first 21 days of the year we've been spending in fasting and prayer. And I hope you found something. I hope you've been spending more time with God. If not, don't not do it because you didn't do it for a week. Make it 14 days. It doesn't matter. Start. Pray. Get on your knees before God. You have access to the King of Kings, the creator of the universe. And how often do we actually take advantage of that? Jesus depended upon it, and so can you. And finally... We have access to the Holy Spirit. We have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and well and available to us today. He was full of the Holy Spirit and led to the wilderness in Luke 4. He returned to Galilee, taught in the synagogues, and prayed in the power of the Spirit and moved in the power of the Spirit, and also in Luke 4. All these are in Luke 4. And he, and he fulfilled prophecy and proclaimed good news to the poor. He set captives free with the Spirit of the Lord upon him. And since we have access to all these things that Jesus had, we have the ability to do the things Jesus did and do even greater things. You want to know why they're greater? Because Jesus' ministry on earth was limited to three years. Your ministry could be 63 years. Okay, maybe that's a little much for some of us that are already 63. All right, but the reality is his ministry was only three years. You can do even greater things. You can love even more people. You can make even more disciples. So the question is, will you strive to be like Jesus? Because you can be. Will you go after him? Will you make that commitment today? In the middle of our 21 days of prayer and fasting, will you make that your goal? Let's join together. I'm telling you, if we do this alone, you're not going to do it. In fact, you cannot do what I'm talking about alone. If you are trying to do it alone, you've already failed. Don't sit here and think, I'm a lone wolf. I'm just going to do it on my own. That's not how, you, honestly, that's not how you work. When's the last time you went to a movie by yourself? I know some of you are that much alone, but most of us are not. Most of us wouldn't even consider going to a movie by ourselves. And we think we're going to follow Jesus by ourselves? Come on. Come on. We don't want to do it with other people because we're scared. And I got to remind you this morning, fear does not come from God. It comes from your enemy. Get in a community group. Are we perfect? No. Not even close. In fact, somebody in your community group is probably going to make you mad at some point. If not right off the bat, they didn't talk to me enough. You know, whatever. I mean, we, we, we all have these things, right? 
Remember who it's for. Remember what this is about. It's about Jesus and going after him. And I believe, I believe, gosh, you know what I really believe? Is that there's 10 people. I've, I've been almost doing this lot, th- uh, this lot thing with God, you know. I believe if five to 10 people catch this idea of being like Jesus, it'll radically change this church. It may even radically change our community. Because in reality, there's a lot of us that are going to start and think it's too hard and we're going to give up. You don't have to. But man, how does God want to use you? Don't give up. Is it going to be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. It's, it's going to take time. It's going to take getting to know people. And for some people, that's a chore and that's okay. You don't have to know 20 people. You really just got to know a couple. You know, I'm more of an extrovert, as you can probably tell. And so I, I like to know a lot of people. Um, and yet, you know, I can get people out too. I understand that. But really, I just, my prayer for you is that you would take your next step. That you would get out of this, the, of the doldrums that you would stop and I'm not talking about anybody like, like as, as a whole, but maybe I hit somebody specifically. Stop being negative about everything and start seeing Jesus in everything. Yeah, life's hard, but Jesus is greater. If we don't believe that, then what are we doing here? I just I so want to see all of us just take a next step. Don't stay where you are. Take the next step. It'll change you. It'll change your family. It'll change your workplace. You can be like Jesus. And we're going to figure this thing out together. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for Jesus. We can look at him and we can uh, just really see um, who he is, what he's like, what he called us to do. And God, I just pray that if there's anybody that's I don't know, worried about the process or even sitting there right now saying, nope, not going to do that. I pray, God, your spirit would just speak to them. I pray that, that, Lord, you would use this series to make us more like you, to um, help us to desire you more than we currently do. That, God, we would truly learn what it means to be like Jesus. I pray that we grow closer together as we grow closer to you and more like you. God, I pray for those who you've called to introduce their coworkers, friends, and neighbors, family to Jesus. God, I would be, I think it's safe to say that the majority of us in this room have not personally led another person to Jesus Christ. And God, if, if, if that inkling is true in my heart, I pray that that would cease to be the case for so many of us, God, because when, when you use somebody like that, what an honor to be your mouthpiece in the life of somebody else. Who are we that you would even be mindful of us? And you call us and you say that if we are in God, we need to live like Jesus. And that means it's possible to be a mouthpiece for the God of the universe. We're not all going to do it the same ways, but we're called to do it. And man, if we let you use us for the kingdom, truly amazing. So for those that are apprehensive, God, I pray your spirit would speak. For those that aren't in community groups and have every reason why they shouldn't be in one, I pray that you would answer every reason, God. For those that don't want to open up their hearts to others, I pray that you'd grant them courage. And I pray that they would be met with grace, mercy, and love. And I pray that you would help us to get our focus off of ourselves. And on to Jesus Christ, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame. God, make us like Jesus. 
it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together.